Hi, everybody. I'm Don Meisner, and I want to welcome you to Up North NY Chat. And uh, boy, we got something to chat about today. I'm with Dave Swanson, and we've been concentrating on the, the lake trout, landlocked salmon, and rainbow trout fishing in the Finger Lakes, Cayuga Lake in particular, because that's where Dave lives. And we've got something really interesting to talk about today because Dave has been doing really well catching landlocked salmon. And what are landlocked salmon? How do you catch them? These are some of the things that we want to talk about. But first, we want to take a look at the video that Dave has been shooting while he's out fishing. So you can see exactly what these fish are we're catching and how he's catching them. Okay, so we're, uh, we're out again tonight. Uh, and we're out, uh, it's a really a beautiful night, clear. Unfortunately, it's almost too beautiful. Uh, bluebird sky kind of thing. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to use a different lure tonight uh, on the end, and it's a real experiment. The lure, we'll, we'll, we'll get up close to it. The lure is a uh, hydra, and it's a lure that a friend of mine was involved in a number of years ago. Don Meisner was involved in it. I got involved a little bit, so I have a supply of these. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a try and see. It's in a rainbow trout color. I think I'm going to put that one out. I'm still going to use a cheater tonight, but I'm going to put it out uh, behind the boat and just for kicks, see what happens. So that one's out. Oh. Now why that one popped, I have no idea. It could be there's too much drag on it because it doesn't act like there's a fish. Oh, there is a fish. Wow. I barely got started. Appears to be a lake trout. <laughs> and it's not a lake trout. It's either rainbow or landlocked salmon, and it's actually on the hydra. Go figure. So, whoa, there's the uh, landlocked salmon, nice fish, put him back, he picked up speed, oh, oh, oh. and there's a hit, trying to, if it's a laker, well, by the way, I'm trying not to uh, bring him up too fast. Oop, he's up on the surface already, wherever it is. Not a very big fish. Not a very big fish. It's a salmon. Probably not quite big enough to keep. And he's gone. Good job. We're almost back to 81 feet. Oh, and there's a fish, there's a fish, there's a fish. Whoa! An active fish on the Hydra. He's a fighter. Nice fish, nice looking fish. Oh, 
Uh, whew. Nice rainbow this time. Beautiful rainbow trout. We'll get him on camera. Beautiful fish. Nice fish. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am about that. Take a closer look at this. This is the Hydra. We'll zoom it in later, but uh, it's got a paddle tail. Causes it to flash pretty well in the water. That was a nice fish. Dave, that, this brings up so many memories, and I want everybody to know that uh, when Dave and I first became friends, and this is going back a long time ago, but I was doing the TV show Streamside, and uh, one of Dave's friends who was on the board of directors of our TV station had wanted us to get together because he knew Dave was an avid fisherman and he just thought maybe we, we would hit it off. And so just shortly after I introduced myself to Dave, I, asked, I said to him, how would you like to go on a trip up into Canada with me fishing for landlocked salmon? And uh, I remember Dave's big smile on his face. And so a week later, up we went, and we went to this lake that had landlocked salmon in. Now, landlocks have always been sort of a, a magic fish, a mystery fish, a fish that people travel great distances to have a chance to catch. And uh, our first experience with the Hydra, the lure that Dave is using, came on this trip. We had just got it. We didn't know if it was going to be effective. We didn't know if the fish would want to hit it. And I remember when we got to Lock Holt, where we went, uh, the people that ran it, Gil came out, Jill, his name was, he said to us, well, yeah, you can use whatever you want, but he was afraid we wouldn't catch any fish. And we ended up catching most all the landlocked salmon on that trip on the Hydra, our first time using it, and we were blown away. And this is kind of what it's like for you now, Dave, down there in Cayuga Lake, and spending the last few years trying to master your ability to go out there and catch landlocked salmon on that lake and finding again, wow, that lure is really effective. You were surprised, I know, when you first tried it. Yeah, I was, I was actually kind of blown away. I really, uh, well, I, I sort of hoped that it would work, uh, but I, it's been, I, I've been here three years now, uh, although I'm only getting it. A bit better this year at the fishing. It took me a couple of years to kind of blend my way through the process and learn. But I, uh, that day, the first part of that video, and I, keep in mind that that was two different days. Uh, one of the videos, uh, the first video was shot, and actually, we didn't show the whole video. That day, I had five strikes all on the Hydra, and three of them were salmon that I could guarantee we're salmon. The other the other two hits were on the hydra, but the fish got off where I got them in, so I didn't I couldn't see what they were. So it was it was a really kind of exciting day. I thought I'd hit on a new technique that I was gonna uh, be uh, constantly busy burying in fish with. Typically as a fisherman you know it doesn't always work out that way, but uh, but then I went out either the next day or the day after. In the second part of the video, uh, you can see my clothes have changed. That was just two days later, maybe. Uh, and with the same kind of success, uh, for those people that are watching the videos, I'm gonna, those haven't been posted yet, they'll be posted shortly after this becomes available. And they'll be able to watch the full version of each one of those days uh, fishing. Uh, and both days have, have obviously had fish on, on video. Well, you know, Dave, one of the things that I wanted to bring out in this, the reason that we're doing these chats that we do uh, is basically to try to lend some, some knowledge and some experience to people that are going through the same thing that you did three years ago and trying to find a place that has salmon and be able to catch them. And it isn't about the hydras, the lure we're talking about, isn't about selling that, the lure isn't made anymore. But what it represents is sometimes there's new ways to do something that might be more effective than the old ways. And in the case of the Hydra, what it represents, it's, um, it's a hard bodied head, a hard bodied plastic head with a little a hook or a little spike on the back of it that you insert a soft plastic in. Now, as the Hydra became marketable, it had its own design soft plastic. But the, the premise is, is the hard head will give it a certain that certain type of look and action and the soft body will wiggle naturally more so than you can make a spoon or a spinner or even a crankbait move 
And in the case of the hydra, it represents, I guess, food or bait that they want to eat. And my thought is, there's a lot of different mineral imitation soft plastics out there that might be able to be effective in fishing for salmon and lake trout and rainbows like you're doing. I don't know, but this is absolutely amazing. If you see the hydra in the water, the action or the, the, what it mimics is so realistic. It looks like a fish swimming. And I think that's why the fish hit it. I don't know, it might be just the right size. And of course the color, you're using a rainbow trout color. Do you think that makes a big difference? Well, I think I think the rainbow trout color helped, but the second fish, uh, where I showed the close-up of the uh, of the lure, was actually a blue and white one. So, I and I I tried. I actually, when you when you when you joke about the the lures not being made anymore, uh, I probably I hate to admit this, but I had several thousand of them. I'm not going to go into that. You know the story behind it, but I won't, we won't bore everybody with the long story about how I ended up with that many. But I had a lot of. Them. Uh, so I decided I better start using some. Uh, but interestingly, I had three different colors of that size. Uh, I have rainbow trout, and I have the blue and white, but I also have fire tiger. And so since those other videos were shot, I tried the fire tiger color, and I have been equally as successful on that color as I have the other two. Uh, interestingly, I think the depth makes a bigger difference in some respects. Uh, the, uh, the first two fish were caught I think it was the first two in the video were caught on the downrigger. I'm trolling at about 81 feet of water, but I'm keeping the downrigger up off the bottom, so I'm running it at about 60 feet. The uh, and and I think you know the lake's got a lot of lake trout in it. I've been trying to just avoid the lake trout because I wanted to focus on salmon and rainbows, and it seem I seem to be more successful with them up off the bottom. Uh, I've got a dipsy diver down about 50 feet, and I've got another, uh, the last fish was caught on a dipsy diver that's only down about 25 feet. Uh, the interesting thing I would know, you mentioned the idea of using other soft plastics, and that may be possible. I'm not sure how they'll swim through the water unless you use some kind of a head on them. If you have a weighted head, which might cause them to stay upright and, and swim, the problem with that is on the downrigger, it might take it down a little deeper than you want it to go. If it's on the dipsy diver, they pull the dipsy diver angle down and affect the depth the dipsy diver runs at. The nice part about the hydra, from my perspective, is that without uh, without anything, if you just cast it, it that particular lure only swims about a foot and a half to maybe two feet at best down below the surface of the water. Uh, so it doesn't really pull pull anything down so it won't, it shouldn't, it doesn't seem to affect any way the dipsy divers and it doesn't seem to affect the downrigger. And I'm not hooking up on the bottom constantly because it's swimming below anything. Uh, so I think, I think the hydra actually works really good for that purpose. Boy, I'll tell you what, I have, I've spent a lot of years trying to catch landlocked salmon. I know on the trip that you and I made to Lock Holt, this is a place that we, we went, we drove thousands of miles and we, we, well, I say thousands, many, many hundreds, well, probably a thousand miles up. And then we took a float plane with duct tape on the sides of it, keeping it flying uh, into this beautiful lake. But most people wouldn't have that opportunity. In New York state, the fact that there is landlocked salmon in the Finger Lakes, in, in Cayuga, in Skinny Atlas, I don't know the other lakes that have them, but this really is an uncommon find because in most states of the country, you don't have landlocked salmon and landlocks have a different characteristic. They're a different fish. What they are is landlocked being lag locked inland Atlantic salmon and Atlantic salmon don't die when they spawn. They're, they're more slender. They have different fighting abilities. They're just a whole different fish than the Pacific salmon that we, we catch in Lake Ontario and that people catch all over the, the North. So I think it's fantastic that uh, we have lakes that have this fishery because they're quite different than any other fish. What would you add to that in terms of what you're enjoying and feeling and experiencing when you catch these fish compared to the other species that you go for? Well, they're, they're, the, the exciting part about the landlocks, and, and landlocks, and, and I've discovered rainbow are, tend to be similar. They both like to jump. Uh, as you and I discovered when we were up in, in Lock Hole, the, the 
the jumping capacity of the fish up there was actually more significant than it was out here, but I've had fish jump two or three times. Um, I had one that one day I was, I had, I caught it on a fly rod early in the season and I'll bet it jumped five or six times. Uh, but the fight is, is, is significant. Uh, and it's just plus from a, from an eating perspective, uh, I, I tend not to keep lake trout anyway, uh, but uh, I do keep an occasional salmon because I like salmon once in a while. The state has uh, some guidance on how often you should have fish taken from the local water, but uh, I, I, so I don't push the issue too much, but I, I do have a few fish that I've kept over the season, and, and but most of them get released, or a lot of them get released. Another interesting thing, though, is the size change. Over the, over the last three years, the size of the fish that I've been catching has gone up. So I caught a landlocked salmon last week that was 24 inches. Uh, That's a really nice fish. Salmon is a nice fish to catch. It's, yeah. it's an exciting fish to catch. One of the things that I want to pass on, too, and we've talked about before, but a lot of times we get caught up in showing the fish and so forth. The technique, number one, what speed have you found because you've been fishing these a lot? Is there a speed that seems to be the speed that they like the most in, in the Finger Lakes? It might be different than Lake Ontario because the forage is different. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I have, I have tried uh, early in the season, I, you know, I would troll with just the electric trolling motor and, in relatively shallow water with a fly rod, so I would get my fly line down deep, uh, and I would be going six tenths of a mile an hour, uh, probably not faster than that, and catching them. And but I, I think at this particular point they're down somewhat deeper, and I'm using the gas motor, and the the, the speed that I discovered that I like the best is about 2.3 miles an hour. I, my gas motor, when I set it on the lowest speed that I can go, I can get it down to about 1.4, 1.5 miles an hour. Uh, but I, I found that I, I, at least I feel like I'm a little more successful when it's going a little faster. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer that with saying it varies, but um, my, my best success seems to be at the 2.2, 2.3 mile an hour. One final thing that I want to ask you, compared to when you started three years ago, basically when you started trying to catch these fish, what are you doing now that is so different than back then? You, you found certain patterns at work and what would you tell people that allows you to go out every day and at least think that you're gonna have, you're gonna catch one of these fish because you catch them so often now? Well, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, when I first started, I was, I, I didn't have the equipment, so I was, I was using lead core line and, uh, and trolling very slowly, uh, with a really heavy rod and, and that lead core line. Uh, but as, as I progressed, I discovered that I become a real fan of the downrigger. I don't like the hum. And by hum, I mean that that, that steel line going down, when, once you pick up a little speed, there, there's a bit of hum to the line, and I think that affects the fish. So I always try to let out a fairly significant amount of line uh, behind the, the weight so that uh, maybe, I, I feel like maybe that helps uh, avoid the uh, uh, hum or the fish. Are, it, it's gone past, so to speak, before the before the lure comes by, and the fish have maybe settled down a little bit. So I, I let out probably fifty or sixty feet of line anyway before uh, 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 after the ball. Uh, and I've discovered, you know, I have I have people I have a, 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 an acquaintance here who's kind of helped me out and given me some advice, and I've discovered that some of his advice is, is pretty good. He's the one that turned me on to the idea of the cheater that I've mentioned in some of the other videos. Uh, but he also has given me the idea that you have to fish deep, and I'm going, I don't like fishing deep because I don't like using the equipment that it takes to, to get down there. I, I really don't like the really heavy stuff. He wants to use big flashers, and I'm not a fan of big flashers because they weigh a lot going through the water. You hook a fish and you feel like you've got a, a, a lot of weight on the line. And, and so while I do use dipsy divers and they add some weight, 
I try to minimize the weight and I try not to go as deep uh, if I can. And I've discovered that the salmon and the rainbow tend not to want to be that deep anyway. They tend to be in the water. So I, you know, I, I look out in the morning and I see boats out there and they're clearly in 100, 150 feet of water fishing. Uh, now they may not be down 150 feet. In fact, they probably aren't. Uh, but they're out deeper, and I've discovered that, and I hit this 81 foot contour. The only comment I want to make about the contour, and I tumble on it by accident, the contour that I'm on at 81 feet happens to be in a section where there are parts of the lake that I troll through where the contours get really condensed, meaning that the shore, the, 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 the bottom drops off fairly quickly, and the 81 foot contour happens to be right in the middle of that drop. So what happens is you're trolling along, and I don't know how wide the contours are between say 80 and 81 uh, farther north of that particular section, but I've noticed that the majority of the fish I pick up in the section where the bottom starts to drop off, and I'm in a contour that's right in the middle of that drop off, which basically means that those lures are coming along above a spot where there's a significant change in the, in the bottom. And I think that's significant. And, I, and, and, and as I said, I hit on that by accident because I didn't really know the contours of the lake until I, uh, uh, until I got some new equipment and started really focusing on, uh, I bought a lake map number one, which was a huge help. Uh, and that's it. Dave, that's fascinating. One, one other thought that comes though is now it's, we're, we're in August, at the end of August. How late in the year or how long does this fishing stay good like this where people can go out and actively fish for salmon or rainbow trout? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. I, uh, uh, I typically try to pull, see, I have my boat in a hoist and they start to lower the lake at some point in late October. And when I lower the lake, once it gets below a certain point, I won't be able to get it out of the hoist. So I pretty much have to pull the boat prior to the point where they lower the lake to the level at which I can't get the boat out. Uh, theoretically, I could go down to the end of the lake, or not down the end of the lake, I go down, uh, there's a launch called Dean's Cove, which is about four miles south of me. I can go down there and put the boat back in and fish uh, later in the season if I wish. I haven't done that, uh, so I haven't tried. So ultimately, I'm fishing right up until second or third week in October, typically, typically and I've caught fish right up to the point that I pulled the boat. You might very easily be catching fish much later than that. Well, I think uh, we've touched on a lot of things. We touched on the fact that uh, a lure of a certain action, a certain size uh, can tend to be really, really good. We talked about structure and how changes in structure and that 81 foot corridor and how it's, it, it's positioned at that change point uh, can make a difference. Uh, depth, speed, there's so much that goes into whether you catch fish or not. And, and, and I think the better we get, sometimes the more we take it for granted. But uh, I hope that the information that we pass on can help people. And there's lots of people out there that don't really know how to go about this type of fishing. And the beauty of it is because we have such diversity in New York state and especially in central New York, that it gives folks a chance to do something that they maybe have never done before. And there are boat launches near where you are. You don't have to have a cottage or a home on the lake like you do, Dave. And, and I think the fishery is probably still relatively underfished comp compared to a lot of parts of the country. What would you think about that? Well, I don't know, on Saturdays and Sundays, there can be quite a few boats out there, but uh, during the week, it's, it's pretty quiet. Typically, I'll, I'll decide to go out. I mean, I, I don't, you know, the nice part about living out in the lake is I get up in the morning and look out and say, okay, it looks like a nice day, I'm gonna go fishing. And so I get up and go out and go fishing. Uh, but typically when I go out, there's only uh, on a weekday, there's typically only one or two boats out at the same time. Uh, mornings over the weekend tend to be busier. Interestingly, evenings on the weekend are not so bad. So I can go out and fish, you know, from 5.30 or 6 o'clock until sunset. And it's like being in the middle of the week uh, with one or two boats out there. Uh, so it's, 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 I think it's, do I want to say it's underfished? No, I don't want to say it's underfished, but uh, is it overfished? No, I don't think it's overfished. I think that, I think there's a pretty decent balance. 
and you can you can go out and there are days if, the, if people watch the videos they'll see there are days that i go out there isn't anybody else on the water i'm the only one out fishing with the time that i go out so there are days that you have the lake pretty much to yourself there are other times that you have to pay a little bit of attention to make sure that you're not conflicting with somebody else and well, we've it, talked on on other chats that we've had about how dave has his boat rigged up with cameras uh and it makes me jealous because for years and years doing streamside, uh, I long to be able to capture the strike. It's not as easy as it might sound. You have to have a camera going all the time. And the fact that on one of your videos that I looked at, you had you were you were looking at a camera talking, and in the background you had your rods, and I'm seeing those rods going off, and I'm thinking, Dave, Dave, you've got a strike. Of course, I'm not there. But it's pretty fascinating to watch those those strikes trigger those rods. And to know that, uh, to just see how this happens from beginning to end. And so I hope that you've all enjoyed our show today. I hope we've given you some new techniques and some new knowledge on how you too could catch some of these amazing landlocked salmon. Until next time, this is Don Meisner and Dave Swanson with Up North NY Jack. Mm -hmm.